it's always fun to see you all pop up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you've got your mask on. <laughs> got mine ready. There's Jean. Hi, Jean. Hi everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we'll give a minute, make sure everybody's coming in and connected. Some are still connecting audio and video. We'll give a minute. Okay. I saw, I saw some of Karen's grandkids today. Oh, oh you did? <laughs> Little ones out playing? <laughs> they were out, down at the pier. Yeah, yeah they're down there. I played grandma and said, and said, please be careful of the nails. <laughs> I don't think you should be on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> A piece of our pier siding broke off. Yeah, like 10 feet long. Yeah, it's oh. really long. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I don't think there's much hope for it personally. I, I don't, there's nothing to attach it to any longer. So yeah. who knows? Hi, Jane Whitney. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. Couple more coming. It's seven is after seven. Okay. Well, it's so good to see all these familiar faces. Hello, everybody. I'm at the library, and I, I wish you were here at the library with me like a normal month, but. <laughs> I stopped at the library today, Tracy, and I ended up with a senior lunch. Oh, well, hey, <laughs> at least you got something. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're jealous, Tracy, that you get to go in the library and we don't. I know. <laughs> it, it's pretty nice to be back. <laughs> oh, yeah. before, before I forget, Tracy, do you, you mentioned in that you have copies of that book? I, I have one. That book. Oh, you have one. Could I have that one? <laughs> yes, yes. Talk to me. Talk to me Friday if you can, and I'll I will arrange okay. to get it to you. Hey, so Tracy, I'll, I'll what happened? Friday. What happened to my window? It's not in the window anymore. Can you see it behind me? No. It's right. Be, it's, you can see one of the panes right behind me in the in the window oh. here. They were they were doing some uh, some repairs in the room we usually meet in. Oh, so okay. Things are, things had to be moved. Yeah. <laughs> But it's still there. It's behind. Oh, me now. I see it now. Yeah, Tracy, I have Michael Perry also in the waiting room. Do you want me to leave him in there? All right. Well, guys, I guess he's here early. If that's all right, wow. we'll go in with him. And if he has to leave, we'll have our our own discussion later. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Whatever he wants. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Okay. I'll let him in. Okay. Here we go. There he is. Hello, Michael Perry. Hi. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, you can hear me okay? We can. Oh, yeah. yes. We can. Excellent. Yeah. Huh. Just being in a tiny little square room, I had to come into to town because we out on the farm have what we call hintering at. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in Bailey's Harbor, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, glad to be here. Well, I was just about to ask, so we'll 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 include you in on this. Um, raise of hands. How many was this the first time you've read Population Forty Five? Because I'm not from Wisconsin. Because you're not from Wisconsin. <laughs> All right. How many? No, I, I had raised my hand, but I have read this a couple times. How many have read other books by Michael Perry? One, few, a few, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good way to embarrass us, Tracy. <laughs> but that was part of the reason we chose this, because some people love Michael Perry and some people had not read Michael Perry. So this was a good this was a good picture. Some people give some people give Michael Perry one star reviews on Amazon. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Can't believe that. No. Oh yeah. It's part of the gig. So what what would you like would can we call you Mike, Michael, Mr. Perry? What would you prefer? Yes, yeah, so I haven't. I, I get that question a lot, and I have an answer. First of all, this is not obviously original with me, but Mr. Perry is my dad. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I always tell people, call me Mike. It's I am. I it is Michael on my books, mm -hmm. and Michael when I'm in trouble with my mom. Oh. <laughs> but other than that, I am a Mike most of the time. 
Well, Mike, we're so glad you're here. Um, one question I had to kind of start this off is this book came out, I believe, like 18 years ago now? Yes, October of 2002. Wow. Okay. So how can much? you tell us how, how has your life changed? What's, what's where are you at now compared to when you wrote this? Oh, not much, other than, other than the parts of the book where I said I'm probably never going to get married and I'm going to get <laughs> my life. <laughs> but even that, um, I, I, when I wrote that book, I was deeply centered. But I also remember writing things in that book about, you know, sometimes I, I wrote about the dog circling the rug and, and the, hearing the semis out on the interstate and always thinking, well, you never know. And, and I think probably the most interesting thing for me, now that you all are already nodding off, um, the most interesting thing for me is how my, that book, that is clearly a book about sense of place. And it's even taught at universities and mm -hmm. stuff in that frame. Um, but what I find interesting is in the 18 years since I wrote that book, I've come to feel that sense of place is portable. And sense of place is adaptive. And, and in one of my books, I've written, <laughs> At this point, millions of words. So I don't remember what I've written. And people will like people will come up to me and go, Thank you so much for that essay about the goat. It changed my life. And, and you go, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I have no idea what you're talking about. I promise I meant it when I wrote it. <laughs> um, but I think I've written somewhere about, and it might even be in population 45, about traveling and and be, being in a place in Wales and feeling like I'd been there a thousand years or being in a small town in Panama where my relatives are and, and saying, oh, I actually, I could be happy here. So as much as that six square miles that I refer to continues to be my geographical heart and I still get up there and I just, just last week I talked to the one-eyed beagle. Um, <laughs> yeah. So some things haven't changed and my heart is still there and it's still my ultimate but Yeah, I mean, I've moved, to, I live about 40 minutes away now, um, not far and we're still up in New Auburn off and less now we're, you know, we used to go up to see my folks at least once or twice a, a, a month. Um, we've had to cut back on that for all the obvious reasons, but um, things have changed, but that still is the center of, that is my point of reference. Hmm. All right. I know. I know. We've got some questions for you, Jane Weiss. Can I start? Can I start with you? You had a couple questions. Do you wanna? Do you wanna ask one? Uh, sure. Um, do I just? I get to pick one. You pick one. <laughs> whichever one you wanna ask. Uh, well, it's related to what you just talked about, Mike, and I wondered what you what you felt was, was that strong draw to stay in your hometown. Um, I grew up in a little, small, rural town and I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get away. I don't think I'd want to live there. Um, and it doesn't mean I didn't have, you know, a good childhood. It was you know, good and bad in our childhood. But I wondered what you felt your strong draw was to get back home and live there. I go off on tangents constantly, as you can tell from reading, writing, um, and so I have a hard time with questions because I thought of about eight things I wanted to say as you were asking that oh. question. Um, but I'll try to. I'll try we get to get time back. if you do. <laughs> I'll try to get back to your point. Um, the one thing I was I was actually not happy to hear you say, but um, but I'm glad you said it was that you were someone who didn't want to stay. In life. Right. And it's interesting because it doesn't happen quite so much now, but especially in the first 10 years after Population 45, I did a lot of speaking at uh, small town schools. And almost invariably, someone, the principal or the teacher, would have a quiet word with me ahead of time and say, one of the reasons we're, we want you to come here is to let the kids know that this, this place is cool too, this place is okay too, this, you know, you don't have to just leave or get out. and." And I always 
was very upfront with the kids when I'd speak about that. I said, I'd tell them, I said, now some of the, some of the folks who brought me here want me to tell you that this is the greatest <laughs> place ever and you're never going to want to leave. I said, but the fact is some of you do want to leave. And I said, and for some of you, it will be the best thing that ever happened to you. And I wish you, I want you to go see the world and I want you to find your place. If this is not your place, I hope you can find it somewhere else. Um, because I happen to be the guy who I was happy there growing up and then I left and then I was happy when I was back. Um, but I also think you can way overstate the whole, you know, oh, it's a great little town. Well, it is for some people. <laughs> And, uh, and the other thing is, and this is part of, kind of gets back to where we started this discussion already, is you know, there's a chapter in Population 485 called My People. And it's one of the hardest chapters I've ever had to write, in part because of what I was trying to say between the lines, but also because I was trying to do it in a way that wasn't condescending or insulting. It's why even in that chapter, I said, who am I to call someone my people? That's not up to me. Um, but I wrote about what it was like to be the guy in town who, yeah, I was a firefighter and go deer hunting and like old pickup trucks, but I also like modern dance. And I also don't think the way that I used to think about everything before I left. Now, 10, 15 years later, I write a book called Montaigne and Barn Boots, which is a book about the French philosopher and essayist. And I have a book in that, or a chapter in that book called Roughneck Intersectionality, which is basically the My People chapter 15 years later. And that one was even harder to write. And part of it is because I, the reason I still love going back to New Auburn and the reason I never stopped loving that place is because I know how to talk, I know how to act, I'm utterly relaxed there. Uh, I did a, I told you I was going to go off on tangents. I went to, a, I spoke at the Tucson Festival of Books, giant book festival up in Tucson, Arizona. And I did a lot of reading, but I also told stories and I did some heartfelt stuff and I did some humorous stuff and I did some things about my brother. And I was talking about my brother, John, and, and I was speaking in his voice, you know, and I, yeah, yeah, me and the chief, we was down to the cafe uh, talking about uh, 30 out sixes. And at the end, they had the Q&A period and the, mon the, the host said, okay, we now have time for questions. If there's anyone who has a question, please raise your hand. And before anyone could get a question in, a woman in the very front row jumped up and instead of asking me a question, turned to address the crowd. <laughs> And she said, I'm from Chippewa County, Wisconsin, and I want you to know that when he does that voice, he's not making fun of his brother. That's how they talk. <laughs> and so sometimes people will, you know, I get criticized sometimes for using big words and, and people say, well, how can you use a big word and write poetically? But then you turn around like, I, I literally, you know, I told my kid, hey, I'm going down to the post office. And, uh, and I, I like mix, mixing up I and me, and I get snippy little letters about, don't you know that's supposed to be me and I? I'm going, hey, that's how I talk, you know? And I'm perfectly uh, able to use a word like declivitus or effluvium if I need to, and they're lovely, beautiful words, and I know what they mean. Um, so what I'm slowly working my way back to is, <laughs> I'm still very comfortable sliding into, um, that particular code and many of those people my brothers included will come to my side under all circumstances mm. to help me that doesn't mean we agree about it right. and i had to make a, a moral ethical decision about a month ago nothing dramatic but it had to do with something where i was like well i think this is what i should do but i'm not sure and i called my brother john because he and i disagree on a wide range of social and political issues, but he has never lied to me and he will do anything for me. And so I called him and I said, I need your advice in, in part because we don't agree on everything. Uh. So the, the final thing I would say is that one of the reasons that I was comfortable staying there is because of what I just mentioned. Even though they like to make fun of me for going to see my flamboyant friend do modern dance in his gold lame g string they also knew that i wasn't going to take it i wasn't going to 
brook any derogatory comments about him. And they knew that if the barn started on fire, I'd grab a hose and run right in there. With <laughs> and that really actually buys you a lot of space. And not everyone can find that space. And so now we're yeah. back to the question, which is, I'm the first person. Sometimes people expect me to go small town living. It's the only way to go. I go, oh, no. Have you seen New York City? It's amazing. Right? <laughs> that might be. <laughs> All right. I do go on. Well, I'll just, I just want to mention, I, that was one of the things I enjoyed, though, your, your ability to, it was like a juxtaposition between this small town feel and talk and your, I had to use the dictionary a lot while I read your book. Yeah. So, so I get that. <laughs> yeah, a lot and of interesting words, your, yeah, your, ability it, to, your ability to fit those into the story. Yeah. And Thank just you. to be clear, uh, trotting out a big word to show off is a complete tin hole. <laughs> And I hope, and sometimes I do overdo it. I mean, there are times when I just, I'll read something I wrote and I'm like, you know, honestly, instead of three pages, you could have just said it was a shovel. Um, oh, I didn't find it. I didn't oh, find it. Um, oh, no, it's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. just taking shots at myself. But, but what I have become unapologetic about is those big, beautiful words. So my first love was poetry. That's what got me into writing. And if you take a word, I mentioned the word declivitous. Declivitous, I see words, words in my mind have colors and shapes and feelings and vibrations. And if, 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 if I see the word declivitous in my mind, it's a shiny word, it's chrome, and it's got a lot of sharp corners, and it's got a beautiful rhythm to it, declivitous, declivitous. And if it fits the line, and if that yeah. rhythm fits the it line, fun. and oh, by the way, it means, and by the way, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking at you, I'm talking, I've had this discussion a lot, so I actually enjoy it, because I'm gonna get to a punchline. Um, the, if that word means is all those things plus you look it up in the dictionary and it means exactly what you're trying to say well then i'm going to stick it in there and i usually try to do it with context so that if you don't want to look it up you still kind of understand what i mean and the other joke that i always make is people say well i had to look that word up in the dictionary and i'll go where, where, where do you think i found it <laughs> where are they keep words and then finally just so that i'm I have a phrase. I always say, why let the fancy people hog all the fancy words? That's right. I on agree. the flip side, because I swear we'll move on to the next question. There you go. To hold my other folks to account, my more roughneck friends, sometimes they're like, when they start getting all anti-intellectual and tearing down academia and all that kind of stuff, I just say, you know, those founding fathers you like to talk about so much, a lot of them were farmers who read French philosophy in the original French. Still doesn't help much, but I see. <laughs> also, the turbocharger on your big four-wheel drive diesel truck was invented by a European with a PhD. <laughs> Anyway, next question. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. I can't see everybody's name. Julie, are you here? I am. There you are. I know you had a question. Go ahead. I'm going to have to read it because um, I forget what it was. <laughs> but, um, looking at you, Michael, I, I just want to say that I also have a space in, in the middle of my front teeth. Estimate. <laughs> Are we lucky? All the cool people have it. <laughs> it means that we'll never be movie stars. Not true. Um, <laughs> Lauren Hutton, Just, David Letterman, Madonna. I mean, I can. Oh. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> Maybe these days. These days, teeth count more. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so I wrote you an email years ago when I, when I saw you speak, after I saw you speak at the door odd, and um, I was too shy to ask you that night. So I wrote you and asked you, how did you know that your wife was the one that you were finally going to choose to marry? And you sent back an answer about respect and you talked about your folks and it hit the spot. And I'm wondering now after all these years of marriage, what you now have to say about a relationship partnership. Well, it's, not, it's honesty time. Um, so in that book, um, in the book, Montaigne and I Barnes. Knew it, I knew it was going to stump you. Yeah. In the book, Montaigne and Barn Boots, which and I've mentioned that twice now, but that book, when I signed the contract to, to do that book, 
I told my editor about half my audience isn't going to like this book. And I was right. <laughs> but it's also interesting in that book, not since Population 485, have I written a book where I've received more heartfelt correspondence, letters and emails. Mm -hmm. And I find that interesting that it's not my most popular book, but it connects with readers and who do like it in a way that uh, not all of my books do. And in that book, I have a chapter called Marriage. And I write real frankly about what it's like to be 15 years down the road. And so my wife doesn't read my books, which I think is great. Um, that's one of the reasons I was attracted to her. If you read um, uh, Truck and Coop, I talk about that. She did not seek me out because she thought I was a great writer. She didn't even know I was a writer, frankly. Um, but in the Montaigne book, when I have learned that if I write something about my wife, even though I change her name, I should run it by her. <laughs> and the marriage chapter is very honest. And, and I, I took it to her and I said, you probably ought to have a look at this one. <laughs> And she read it, and when she handed it back to me, she said, <laughs> yep. Uh, so if I was expecting her to go, oh, no, oh, honey, oh, no, she just said, yep. And I would say that we are at that point in our marriage <laughs> where we are working through all of those things you hear about, where, you know, people say it takes work, and you go, oh, turns out it does. <laughs> uh, and we're also, we have now a 20-year-old and a 13-year-old, and so we're at that point where we've worked so hard to raise those kids right and to raise them in a weird circumstance where we're self-employed and kind of patching a weird life together that we're at that point now too where we look at each other and go well do we know how to act around each other if we're not talking through kids and so i will, I will tell you that everything that i wrote i absolutely still stand by i i never had a second thought about getting married and getting married to my wife changed my life in ways I never could have anticipated it made me a better person um, I always say you know she brought me she brought me a daughter you know and I love that kid and now we have two daughters and there's a dimension to me that I'm not saying that if I didn't have kids, I wouldn't have been a full person. I, I, I really stand against that too. You, it, you, know, you don't need someone else to complete you, but you can certainly be amplified by the people who come in your life. And my wife brought me that little girl that's my given daughter and then uh, our second daughter. So sometimes people, when they hear me talk about being at the work, portion of the marriage. They get very concerned, like, oh, well, you know, should you not or should you? I go, no, I never had a second thought about it. I have zero regrets. And honestly, we're a very stable couple. We, we, none of what I'm telling you here would surprise her. Nothing I'm saying would, would have her going, oh, you shouldn't have done this. Like, no, this is how it is. We're, we have respect and affection, but we also know that you got to keep working at it. And so, um, did I even answer your question? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I, I've always said, I, I'm not a man who's into guarantees. I mean, who knows? Well, it, it, um, but, the, but the issue of being able to say that I'm proud and grateful to being married to her is absolutely you true. You answered it in a typical Michael Perry way. In other words, kind of went off on a mealy mouth tangent forever and tried to make a joke at the end. <clears throat> yeah. I was surprised a moment ago when you said that um, you were talking about other people who are fancy. You don't think that you are fancy? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not cool. I, I, I was cool for about three and a half minutes in the late 80s or early 90s. Um, <laughs> remember the actual incident. Um, fancy, of course I'm fancy. See, now it's, this is going to turn into a, this is supposed to be me talking about Population 485. I'm going to now talk about Mont the Montaigne book all night. But there's a chapter in the Montaigne book called Amateur Aesthetics, in which I address these very things. In that, 
I truly am a boots on the ground. This morning I was out moving chickens and fencing and yesterday I was using a chainsaw to cut up a tree that blocked our driveway after the windstorm. And I truly love hanging out with a one-eyed beagle and eating cheese curd. But I also had to arrange to have some coffee beans delivered yesterday because I was out of the fancy ones and frankly, the other ones weren't any good. And in that amateur aesthetics chapter, I write about that. And, and that whole dichotomy, is it dichotomy or binary or something? I'm not good at the terms, but dialectic maybe. Um, where it's kind of like the fancy words. Yeah, it, you can be a, a down to earth person, but that doesn't mean that you should sacrifice beauty and grace. And uh, I have a coffee cup I like because I love the heft of it. I write about it in the Montaigne book. Well, that's embarrassing to tell my brother the logger, you know, because like, <laughs> it feels nice in my palm and it's got a nice heft. <laughs> but the flip side would be if I'm if I'm running chickens to the butcher in the truck and I stop at the Quick Trip, I also love like the Quick Trip gas station coffee and that because there's something about driving down the road in the pickup drinking that that's also lovely and satisfying. So. Yeah, of course, I, I, the thing, I am fancy in some ways. The, where I get into trouble, here's the answer and then we'll move on. <laughs> where I get into trouble is when I try to be fancy. <laughs> Good point, I like that. <laughs> it's a distinction, yeah. Well, to bring it back to population 45, uh, Linda had a question about firefighting. Linda, do you wanna, do you wanna ask? <laughs> Related to firefighting, anyway. Don't forget to unmute unmute yourself, Linda. Uh -oh. Okay, there you go. Yay! Yay. Um, so yeah, I was really interested in the uh, in the firefighting aspect of the book, and I wondered if you ever watched uh, movies like Backdraft or TV shows like Chicago Fire, and if so, did you find the rescue scenes in those books creditable? I've never watched Backdraft or Chicago Hope. I've seen short bits of each and <clears throat> just found it so ludicrous that I just couldn't go on. <laughs> all, the, all the romance. There's always a but. There's always a, I want to, this is going to be. And if you enjoy it, you should watch it. Here, here, so, tangents, but I swear <laughs> this is relevant. So my 13-year-old daughter just did a school project. They are supposed to, they can do a presentation on anything. Well, she's an old soul. She loves to watch the, the, um, the Lucille Ball show. And she loves, she loves, I love Lucy. She's, and she likes to watch old TV shows. And then we got her to watching MASH. And so for her project, she wanted to do a story about the, about mass units. And it just so happens that outside of our town, there's a 97 year old man mm -hmm. who was a surgeon in, in the Korean War uh. and was on the front lines. And he, then he went on to become a rather renowned surgeon and he invented an arterial graft while in the field in Korea. And so she went and interviewed him and I was just so proud of her because she just sat and asked him questions. I just love to see the 13 year old listening to the 97 year old. And he's a spectacular man. But she, the first thing she did, of course, and she said, um, she, I love the TV show MASH. What do you think of MASH? <laughs> said, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. And he, and he went down the list, he's like, the doctors would never run out to the helicopter pad and the nurses would never do this and all this. But, but then, and this is where I'm gonna get back to your question. He then said to her, he said, I was so excited when that show was coming out. And my wife and I, and that of course would be back in the days when you had to wait till it came on that one time on TV. Right. And he said, and so my wife and I, we were all ready and we sat down and, and it started, and of course, even in the credits, I'm like, that would never happen, and that's ridiculous, and this is awful. And, and at some point, he said, my wife turned to me, and she said, 
either you shut up and watch this with me or you have to leave. And she loved the show. And so he basically was, he told my daughter, he's like, yeah, I, I just couldn't watch it. But a lot of people really enjoyed it and that's more important. So, so yes, right. that, when I see that kind of, you know, you see little things like the, the person in, in a traumatic intensive care situation who has a nasal cannula and getting two liters and you're going, yeah, that's ridiculous, but they can't have their face blocked off because they have some lines or something. So, so I try not to be that guy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mike, I have to tell you, I went down a rabbit hole yesterday. Oh boy. My husband and I lived in New, New, New Auburn for two oh years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> An old so is that the, is He's that the, the yearbooks. <laughs> oh. Oh, the yearbooks. Oh. oh, don't look pretty old. Was I a grade schooler then? Or? Yes, <laughs> I, I looked you up. <laughs> I had hair and a cowlick. And... <laughs> yeah, my husband, it was my husband's first teaching job in New Auburn. He taught probably five preps, coached everything. <laughs> yeah. But I, found picture, but I found pictures of you. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, well, so in, I always say in grade school, I was an overachiever. And then somewhere around seventh or eighth grade, I just kind of started to coast. <laughs> Well, this was fourth and fifth grade for you. Fourth grade, I had the, one of the finest teachers ever, Milo Fawson. An oh, I, yes, we know him. <laughs> amazing man. And I'm so <laughs> grateful to say, uh, there's a story about him. I told it on that Wisconsin public television show that just, it, I, I, probably, I can't get through it uh, because it, he, he, there was a girl in our class that got, we picked on constantly. And she's one of those kids that you find out later as an adult, you realize she was from what we now call a dysfunctional family and poverty stricken and all these things. And we made fun of her mercilessly. And the very quick version is one day, Mr. Fawson said, the third grade teacher needs help with a project. Um, how, who of you here would like to get out of class and go help her? And of course, everybody shot their hands up. And then he chose the girl that we always picked on and said, Mary, why don't you go? And she went and as soon as she left, he said, I want you all to notice something. When I asked who wanted to go help, every single one of you raised your hand, except for one student. You know which student didn't raise her hand? And of course, we were all, and he said, Mary didn't raise her hand because she's terrified to do anything in front of any of you because you're so awful to her. And he dragged us over the coals. And it was a powerful moment. You can tell I'm still moved by it and have never, ever forgotten it. And I was so fortunate because uh, I was able to get into touch with him right after he retired and we had a wonderful exchange and I was able to thank him in a letter for that. And I know that he read it because he answered and then he quite uh, unexpectedly died. Um, and I'm still in contact with his wife and daughter uh, via the occasional Facebook post. We don't really know each other anymore, but yeah, he was wonderful. Uh, did, I'm sorry, did you have a question and I'll just steam oh. right you? <laughs> no, I just wanted to let you know we live there. Okay. In the trailer park because we were poor. <laughs> yeah, I know the trailer park. Yeah. <laughs> that, the trailer park is in population 485. Of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mike, what can you tell us about the, the play now of population 485? So, um, well, a couple of things relevant to you folks. I. So for years, I have a friend named Justin Vernon. He has a band called Bon Iver, and he's won a couple of Grammys, but I knew him back when he was poor and, and uh, had nothing. And so we were buddies back then. And um, he, for years, told me, and I'm going to be mean to him, but I can because we've known each other forever. Uh, for years, he, he cited with, uh, Population 485 when he started to get famous. Um, like the, in an interview in the New York Times, and I did not know anything about this, by the way. This is not, I, this is not something I told him to do. Um, I read about it in the New York Times like everybody else. And he said, what was part of your inspiration for this music? And he said, well, there's this book, Population 45, and it conveys where I'm from and how I feel and writes about the countryside that I know in a way that moved me. And so off and on, he would tell me, especially after he had some success, he said, dude, you gotta, you gotta, we gotta do that on stage, like a musical version of that or a play, that'd be great. And 
So I say, okay, any time. Well, about five years in, I realized it, it, it was never going to happen. And the only way it would happen is if I did it. So I started writing a play and about 10 years went by since he first mentioned it. And then I realized if I don't, I'm just never going to finish it because I didn't, no one else was asking for it. I didn't have a deadline. And so I had my booking agent rent a series of small town theaters and tell them that we were going to come and put on the play Population 485. <laughs> but I didn't tell them because I hadn't actually written it yet. <laughs> and so then I'm like, okay, we paid, we put our money down because <laughs> I was financing all this through my own pocket. You know, there had had to be a family meeting about that first. And uh, so I booked the theaters and then I got to work on it. And then I came to Door County uh, to the Right On organization there. And I was so privileged to be able to go into Nord Bly's Coop, uh, which is out back there. And for three days straight, I went out to Nord Bly's Coop. I, I was allowed to take a thermos of coffee and two granola bars, but I couldn't come back until I'd worked all the way past lunch. And then I worked again in the afternoon. And after three days, I had the full first rough draft of the script done, and then I revised it and then, you know, got it pretty much buttoned down about two weeks before the first rehearsal. So, and then we just, uh, I hired, uh, I formed a little LLC and got workers comp and insurance and everything. And then I hired a local guy to be my director. And we did, uh, we got together a little troop of folks and we went around in Wisconsin for about two years, not a ton of performances, but several. And it was a great experience. I very much loved it and enjoyed it. Um, we actually, made a little money. I think we're the first theater group ever to finish in the black. Um, but it was so much work and so much, it was very nerve wracking. And I was responsible for all those people when we were on the road. And, and because I'm a responsible boy, I had workers comp and paid everybody on the record and did all those things. And so after two years, I just said that was a life's a life fulfilling event. I'm ready for someone else to do it now. <laughs> so since then, I'd say five to 10 theater groups have rented the script and put it on and, awesome. and yeah, it's been wonderful. An Open Insult Players did a reading of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know, did anyone, did anyone go to that? Did anyone yeah, see that? I saw it, it was good. Good. This is my husband, Michael. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Hey, how are you hey, doing? Uh, Milo, Milo and I were good fishing buddies. Oh, we no, spent a lot. Milo and I spent a lot of time together. We even got together when uh, when he moved to Clintonville as an administrator. Yeah, uh, we I was in Appleton at the time. When we got together. Yeah, Milo and I. We were there was a small group of teachers in New Auburn, so you had to kind of bond with whoever was there. <laughs> what a fine man! I re, I re, my other favorite story about him is, and you you would not be allowed to do this today. <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember, but he would when we had to go anywhere as a group, he would line us up in the hall in formation. And we marched and we had to say, um, hold your head up, hold it high. Fourth grade class is passing by. Left, right, <laughs> yeah, left, that's right. Milo. Yeah. Now, Milo, uh, we, li we lived in a mobile home park in New Auburn. Milo yeah. and I, we were, we were two, home, 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 uh, two places. That was, our, that was our first home. And, uh, and I remember uh, we, we, we went to New Auburn and I, I'd been in New Auburn once for the interview, yeah. for the job. And then they called me, they said, you're hired. So the second time I was ever in New Auburn was, was to start living there and teaching. And I, I, I remember we pulled in our mobile home into this mobile home park and um, I needed to get telephone coverage at the, at the co-op telephone. And I called up them and I said, I said uh, well, this is Bruce. Oh, you're the new science teacher at the high school. <laughs> I, had, I had not been in New Auburn in my entire life except yeah. for the second time and they knew my history and they knew where I was going and who I was going to teach. And it was a, yeah. it was a very unique community. <laughs> That's, I think I tell that story in population 45 that I bought my house, but I hadn't told anybody. And I went to uh, the post office to get a post office box. And I, I presented myself at the desk and said, I'm here to get my post office box. And the lady looked up and she said, Oh yeah, we heard you were coming. <laughs> exactly exactly okay. uh, i didn't want to intrude i just wanted to say hi michael thank you for your book i loved your book uh 
I think I knew every one of the families that you described, <laughs> despite your attempt to disguise them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, on writing about your New Auburn neighbors, Jane Whitney, do you wanna do you wanna ask your question? Make sure to unmute. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder about muting. Yes, um, I was. I was. Um, I loved. I loved your work. I grew up in a small town as well, just not in the Midwest, out of east, and uh, lots of similarities, of course. Um, I was just wondering though about you are so perceptive about people and it seems that you can find what's common in people what's unique in people and what's universal in people it seems you are um it seems that you're a quick study i i wonder if you think you're a quick study of people um and and those aspects of those people that make them um special or do you find um and be and because you are perceptive about who people are, or at least it certainly comes across that you are. I wonder, does this, for your relationships with people, do you find that you might not be present with them, but you're always sort of just stepped back a bit because you're listening with one ear, but thinking about them with another? Uh, you know, uh, are you with them or uh, do you find yourself slightly removed from them? I was, I was fine with everything that you said right up until that end part about being, not being present with people because it hits a little too close to home. Yes, I'm, I'm a very sincere person. And I think that comes across. I speak from the heart. And, but I am, it's very active in here. And like my wife doesn't like, well, she would, we wishes we would go out to eat more, I think. But we have a hard time when we go out to eat because I'm constantly following the story one booth over. Um, and I am always, and not in a creepy way, but there's just the way my head fires is that I hear people talking, but I'm, I'm reading all the signals and the, I'm, my wife studies a lot of yoga and meditation and shamanism. And I'm, I'm still pretty much 90% farm boy, but I do catch a vibe off people. And I do tell, I've told my kids, yeah, I, I am pretty good at reading people for better or worse, but I have two vulnerabilities and, and I always make sure my kids hear that. And one is that about 10% of them, every once in a while, I'm dead wrong. And so I try to never forget that. Um, and then my other greatest fault, and I inherited it from my father, is I really will go out of my way to think the best of people even long after they've proven they don't deserve the consideration. And so I actually have to be a little bit on guard for that. But I think that arises out of this, just this deep seated desire and longing, frankly, for people to bridge those gaps. And that probably plays into where I've ended up in the My People chapter. And uh, in, in Montaigne, I have the, that chapter, Roughneck Intersectionality, where I talk about being a roughneck, I grew up uh, logging and farming and hanging out with really pretty rough folks. And then I wound up in the art world and, and, and people with lifestyles that I never envisioned or understood. And now I find I take great joy in. And so I think there's a part of me that just, I just, I sometimes have to stop myself from just pleading with people going, look, we had a great time at the softball tournament, but you can also have a great time at the modern dance recital. Let's go to the poetry reading and the stock car races. They're both fun. Why are you looking at each other so with so much reservation? And so, yeah, I, I think it, I'll tell you that, and I don't want to, none of this, you know, I always say I'm a writer with a small W. Nobody ever asked me for my opinions or to solve things. You know, I'm always mainly trying to pay the rent, but uh, that doesn't mean you can't still write from the heart. And I do get incapacitated sometimes by, you know, what's going on now. It's like, it's just so saddening sometimes when you see what's the gulf between people and it's, it's nothing, it's silly, it's built of sour cotton, man. It could be swept away in a heartbeat, but for some reason people are resistant to it. So yeah, that is 
part of how I read people. I just sort of try to, and some of it has to do, I just finished a live stream with my old university and I talked there about being, I have a nursing degree and it was the best preparation ever for a guy who wound up writing because nursing, you know, it's all about human assessment. Hmm. That's what you're doing as a writer is human assessment. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that leads well to Allie's question. Allie, do you want to, do you want to talk? <laughs> How did you decide to change careers from nursing and go into writing? It, it was not conscious at all. I always tell people, I'll say, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? And I really didn't. And I, I, again, I'm just trying so hard to keep my answers under 40 minutes. But um, so the, the short version is, Raised in a, an obscure fundamentalist Christian sect where we didn't have television, we had no radio, we didn't go to movies. Um, but I was raised in love and safety. We were poor, but I never went to bed hungry. So I, you know, I had a safe home and food, the greatest privileges of all. I was loved. But the good news is my mom loved books. And so she took us to our little local library and we brought home piles and piles of books. And when I was tiny, and I've expanded on this, I think in the book Coop, I expanded on this whole thing and how it happened over the years. But the short version is my mom saw that I loved books. She taught me to read when I was four. She ordered a phonics book from a Chicago newspaper, taught me how to read with that book. And then I read voraciously in seventh grade. I had an English teacher who gave us a free writing assignment. I'd never done anything like that before. I didn't know what to do, but then found myself feeling the same excitement I got at playing football and knocking heads. I got excited about writing and, but then went right back to being a football player knucklehead, kept reading books, but I never, it never occurred to me living in logging world, farming world, roughneck world, it never occurred to me that someone like me could write books. That was for authors with a capital A and those people weren't anything like me, right? And so then I went to nursing school, very prescribed curriculum, but it was one of those dread liberal arts colleges and I had to fulfill a humanities credit. So I took a creative writing course and it changed my life. I loved what we did. I loved most of all the feedback. The first time the professor criticized one of my poems and slashed it up with his red pen. I watched other people crumple and be hurt. And I found myself feeling like I was on the blocking sled. Like he said, you can do this better. And the, the, the football coach would say, hit him harder, hit him harder. And I'd go, okay, I will. And when, when my professor said, you can write better, instead of being hurt, I went, okay, I will, I can. And I went home and I revised and revised and I was excited to bring it back. But then I went right back to nursing school got my nursing degree, started working as a nurse, and I was happy working as a nurse. I don't know that I would have been a nurse forever, but I was happy doing it. And very early on, I, I went to the library and checked out a book on how to be a writer, because I heard you could get paid to write magazine articles. And then I went backpacking around Europe for a couple of months, and I wrote every day, having no idea why. I did not, it was not like, I will compose my memoir. No, I was just writing, because I knew I wanted to write. And so when I came back, um, in the summer of 1989, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna, I, I, I read that book on how to be a writer. I'm going to try to be a writer. And if it doesn't work, I'll just, I'll go back to being a nurse because I like that too. And 30 years later, that's pretty much still the plan. <laughs> I have that, I renew my nursing license every two years. So it was gradual. I started writing um, magazine articles, newspaper pieces. I started sending out articles and pitches and essays and just getting rejected constantly. But another great privilege I had was I was a single male with a good degree. I was living in poverty, but it was a poverty of choice. And I knew there's no Charles Dickens situation. I knew that within a day I could go get a good paying job. So, and then eventually I self-published four books and then I got a contract with Harper Collins for population 45 and um, just been plugging away ever since haven't become rich haven't become famous but make a decent living so yeah there was no one big moment it was just sort of a slow well it went off on a tangent <laughs> so have you ever ridden in the parade on the float with the sign rider no. <laughs> okay no but I I have been in the Jamboree Days parade driving a fire truck and whipping candy go. at the kids. So <laughs> that's a 
top 10 highlight right there. Yeah, that's, I love that you're referring to that. That's that tricky thing and we're, we're sort of, we've alluded to it in other questions where I'm a writer with a small W, you know, they don't ask the guy at the feed mill to ride on a float and say, I beg feed, but that's just as important. And so when they asked me to do that, I knew they were being really sweet and, and kind, but I had to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, we don't want to take up your whole night, but do you have time for a, a, one, one or two more questions if anyone has them? <laughs> Sure, shoot, as long as we're online, shoot me a couple more. All right, all right. Back home, the internet's going to really be bad. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question with your um, talking about all of the authors that you read when you were a, a young man. What were some of your favorite books that you read in your tween and early teen years? Ooh. Well, I'm actually going to, uh, I read, I, I read ahead of my age. I don't mean that, I'm not bragging, I just, I just did, and I had a pretty big vocabulary. In fifth grade, uh, a teacher wouldn't accept one of my papers, and she turned out to be one of my favorite teachers, uh, but she wouldn't accept one of my papers because she didn't believe I wrote it. And I remember my parents having to come in and we had to have a meeting. Wow. And my mom, I think, brought along some things I'd written at home or something and said, nah, I'm, I know he's a little snot, but I'm afraid he really can't write it like that. <laughs> and um, so I remember in third grade reading All Quiet on the Western Front. And uh, in Coop, I think I talk about how that book changed my thinking in third grade. Um, but I'm sorry to report that most of my reading all through high school really wasn't that edifying. Um, I read the Bible every week um, because of the church I was raised in. And when I say every week, just so that we're all being honest here, I was in a church that was, we didn't believe in church buildings, so we met in, in homes. And you were expected to have read your Bible all week and then prepared some thoughts on some verses. So I read my Bible every week. I may have read it only once a week and possibly in the 10 minutes sitting quietly right before I was supposed to speak, which has led to, speaking of things that prepared you to be a writer long before you knew you were going to be a writer, I can pretty much, I can bust out a homily on whatever you hand me, man. The back of the toothpaste, an email, you know. Crest has, be, has been shown to be an effective decay preventive dentifrice from a conscientiously applied program of oral hygiene. And what does this say to us about how we should live? <laughs> so, but in my teen years, I would have to say that I would bet, and my father will back me up on this, much to his dismay, probably 70% of what I was reading was cowboy books. Um, I loved Louis L'Amour cowboy books. And of course, having a arrived at the age that I am now, having broadened my literary horizons, and also, I hope, my understanding of the world and this country. Um, I'm very aware of those parts of Louis L'Amour cowboy books that are, as we say, problematic. Uh, but I also have to say, every time I finished a Louis L'Amour cowboy book, the last thing I did was read his bio, which was in the back. And this was still while it never occurred to me that someone like me could be a writer, but a seed was planted because if you read that bio, Louis L'Amour was born in North, now I'm going to forget it because I haven't read it for so long, but uh, North Dakota, I believe. Um, blue collar job, blue collar background, worked on ships as a freighters and that sort of thing. And I remember when I finally started thinking, well, maybe I could write. I remember flashing back and going, well, wait a minute, Louis L'Amour didn't go to a fancy college and have an MFA. So a lot of it was reading that, um, but I was also reading poetry and I was reading a lot of history. I read a lot of his, at that time, I loved to read about World War II. I think partly coming out of All Quiet on the Western Front, having read it all those years ago. I read a lot about the Civil War, um, but it wasn't until college that I started really reading with intent. Um, and that was thanks to that creative writing teacher. I started reading poetry. I started reading some fiction. And, and from there, I've tried to improve myself since. But my dad will tell you 
And I think I quoted in one of the books. So I was a farm kid and while we weren't overworked, we were expected to help. And dad talks about always having to go and find me. And I always had my nose in a book, which led to the famous quote of my father saying, I lost more man hours to Louis Lamore than to football pickup trucks and girls combined. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I wish that I had said, oh, I was reading Proust. <laughs> I wasn't, I was reading cowboy books. My, my, my English teacher did make me, my one English teacher, we did study Shakespeare. So I was actually reading that and getting some understanding. I had another teacher and my other English teacher, okay, this is a shameful truth. I took a world literature class, but my teacher, to put it politely, should have retired a long time before I got to it. She was also completely overloaded. She was trying to teach two classes at once. And so let me stick. And by the way, when she died, and this is not a joke, I wrote her family a letter of apology because I was a high school kid. I was never mean, I was never vicious, but I had a smart mouth and I made her miserable. She was in overhead and I knew it and I think I made it worse. But one of the things I did with her because she really didn't pay close attention is we were, the only thing we had to do for world lit, the only thing, the only requirement for an entire semester was to hand in two book reports. I was the kid, I read every book in the high school library. I was the kid who was reading constantly. I could have cranked out a book report on something I read in 20 minutes, but no. I made up a book and wrote a book report about it, about a book that didn't exist because I didn't think she was paying attention. And so I wrote this whole book. I still remember the title. It was called Fire in the Marsh. And and the guy who knew Milo Fawson probably went duck hunting. There was a big marsh outside of, of New Auburn. And I wrote about, it was a father and a son and they were volunteer firefighters. No, they were just, they weren't firefighters. They just lived out there, but a fire started in the marsh and it got into the peat and they couldn't put it out. And the father and son fought with each other, but in fighting this fire in the marsh, they were drawn together and had a reconciliation. I mean, and the irony there too is like, I got along great with my dad. We, we bumped heads, but compared to most, like I always loved and respected him. So I wrote this whole book report about this book called Fire in the Marsh, which did not exist, handed it in, got an A, <laughs> and then had to write another book report. So I told my buddy, Bullwinkle, I said, I really don't think she's paying attention. I think I can hand it in again. <laughs> This was the day of manual typewriters. I retyped it and I handed it in again. And I got one time I got an A minus, and once I got an A. <laughs> now, I mean, and, and again, the great irony is that of all the kids who could have just picked out of a stack of 50 books I probably read that semester, I had to make one up. So, yeah. What was the question? Great, thank you. <laughs> Fire in the mark. It's not available anywhere. You need to write that. <laughs> there you go. That should be one of your next books. Make up for that. <laughs> what can you tell us about your book that just came out recently? Oh, okay. How's that? Yeah, that'd be a good way to wrap up. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is kind of fun because, I, as I mentioned already, I started out self-publishing. My first four books were self-published. I didn't know any other way. I'm living in Chippewa County, Wisconsin. I don't go to, I didn't know anybody in New York, and, which is where 90% of publishing was in those days. I didn't have an agent. I don't know any of that stuff. So once again, I went to my local public library and I checked out every book I could find about self-publishing. And of course, back in those days, I had to get it someone who knew how to lay things out on these new things, these Macintosh apples that they had. And then I had to get the file on a floppy disk and take it to the printer and actually get printing quotes. And then since there was no print on demand, I had to get a thousand of them, 500 of them in order for them to be a price that I could even manage. And so I, I started out self-publishing. I've now done several books with them. I've done a couple of books with Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, I have two more books coming out. Um, one with Sourcebooks, who is a publisher out of Illinois, and then I have a book, another book coming out with Harper Children's. Um, 
But in the meantime, what happened is I've also built up this one thing I learned early is that if you're going to make a living doing what I do and you're not world famous and you don't sell a million, if I'm going to truly make a living at it, I have to have what they call in the business world, multiple streams of revenue. And so way back when, even though I'd rather, I'm shy. I know you don't believe it seeing this. You don't believe it if you've seen me on stage, but I would prefer to never come out of my little room. I just want to stay there and write. And if you meet me out at the store, I'm not this guy. I'm the quiet guy who gets really uncomfortable talking to people. But I've learned how to do this because way back when I realized, oh, well, if you do a book reading and you make it funny and entertaining and you speak from the heart and you tell stories you really mean, people like that. And eventually you get asked to come and give other talks for where they actually pay you. And then if you start asking people to pay you and, and then you just start putting together one man shows and you just rent theaters and you do your own shows and you charge people money to come. And so over the years, I've built to the point where about as magazine freelance writing income has declined because magazines have evaporated for all intents and purposes. <clears throat> my speaking and performing income came up to kind of help replace that to where it's about roughly speaking 50% of our family's income is me presenting myself in public in some format. Yeah. Well, obviously about three months ago that went to zero <laughs> overnight. And the good news is, and I have, if you go to the, if you go to my website right now, I've actually got a link to the new book. If you just go to Sneezing Cow, the pinned post has got all the information you need. <clears throat> but I talk in there about people have asked, do you need us to donate? And I do have a donation thing that I do some videos and stuff. I'm like, if, you, if, you're, if you're so moved, great. But I make it very clear, look, <clears throat> we were planning for this. Yes, it's put a crimp in some things, but man, there are people all around me who need help at a far greater extent than I do. So none of this is me going, oh, please, I mean, things are fine. But when that went, went away, I've got these two books under contract with a publisher and I'll get paid when I finish those books and stuff, but they're still several months away. And I've had several of what I call these desk drawer projects that they're really not quite right for a publisher and they really don't make money for a big publisher, but as self-publishing projects, they'd be fine. And I just, some of them are 10 years old, some of them are two years old, but I've just never gotten to them because I've been on the road so much and also trying to hit all my writing deadlines. So when the COVID-19 thing happened and the, the live stuff just went out the window and I was just canceling all those paying gigs, I thought, well, now's the time. And so I self-published two books so far. Um, one is just a tiny little one um, called Big Boys, Big Rig. And it's Rather than get into explaining it now, if you go to the web page, it's, it's a tiny little book and there's context for why I did it. And, um, but um, the subtitle of that book is The Leftovers, which really tells you everything you need to know. Um, <laughs> this one here, this is the new one. It's called Million Billion. And it's a collection of Roughneck, Roughneck Grace columns. They're, they're essays, but they're about five to 600 words each. They're pretty short. And they start as Roughneck Grace columns for the Wisconsin State Journal. And so this, is, this represents the columns through the, and a lot of people don't, that don't subscribe or can't get to it uh, have asked me to do it in book form. So these are the essays um, covering from March of 2016 to March of 2018. And it, they're really all over the board. Um, I tend to write one column that'll be really heartfelt and reflective, and then I'll write one that's silly and goofy. It's a lot like Population 485. Hilarious, one page, if I may. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm kind of funny. Yeah. And, and then on the next page, heartbreaking. Um, and so this is like that, only the pieces are, are quite short. But it's been a blast self-publishing because it's reminding me, it's been invigorating. It's why and how I got into this in the first place. And I still cherish my relationship with what we call the legacy publishers. But the truth is they're really in trouble in trying to find their way. And so this has been a good way for me to um, get my old DIY do-it-yourself feet under me again. And, so yeah, this is the new one, Million Billion. The other really fun thing is that I have a friend who's a local graphic artist and he did just an, a wonderful job on the book cover. It incorporates a field that is right near my farm. Um, and then also being able to hire a local printer. Some of these are on, through some national print on demand. Um, I, I have to always try to make sure that I don't forget indie booksellers because they put me on the, the little bit of map I'm on. I'm there because of them. But I also have to be realistic about getting my book to as many people as possible. So my first choice is that 
Uh, I do the distribution of this book through a company called Ingram, and that's who takes care of independent booksellers. So your indie bookseller, if you ask them about it, even if they don't have it in stock, if you tell them it's on Ingram, they can get it. And that's my number one preference. But I also understand that for budgetary reasons, some people uh, go to Amazon, it's on Amazon as well. Um, and so what I try to do is then some of the print on demand is done at Ingram or done through the KDP program, but we also just printed a big old pallet full right here in, my, uh, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin at a local printer working with local people. And all of, if you order a book from my website, all of the fulfillment is a, a small local uh, company that does fulfillment for bands. They do, they send out, if you order an album or a t-shirt for these bands, they send it and they have one client who's an author. So <laughs> actually they have several, they're doing Nicholas Butler's work now and a few other people too. But, so it's called Million Billion. And my daughter today asked me, my 13 year old said, why'd you call it Million Billion? I said, cause that's after, cause I like the way it sounds. It's fun to say, but it's also, there's a piece in here called Million Billion, which is about uh, the fact that I don't have a million billion and what I'm going to do with my second million. That's, <laughs> I always think it's really safe to say, well, here's what I'm going to do with my second million. <laughs> So I don't know, I, I could go on, but honestly, if you go to sneezingcow.com, as I said, the pinned post has more information about that book and, and your indie bookseller can help you track it down. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful that you took the time to gather up with me through the computer here. I'm gonna put on my glasses one more time because whenever I have my glasses off, I'm just seeing little blobs. So uh, oh. it's good to see your faces. Yeah, maybe we look better with them off. <laughs> well, how do you think I feel about what I'm looking at in my screen? <laughs> Got the nice, got the glow. I do, I've always been grateful. I'm that guy that when I finally did go bald, I've got the really nice round dome. Right. <laughs> it reflects the light very evenly. It's aesthetically pleasing. Thank you so much. I, I truly, one thing I, I don't want to forget to say this. As you can tell tonight, none of this was planned. And I'm, I'm, um, I quit my last, I quit nursing in 1988 was the last time I punched a time card as an RN. Um, 1992 is when I quit my last, I took a job making minimum wage just to pay the rent while I was getting my feet under me. So in 1992 is the last time I ever had to go to work for someone else. Hmm. And that has only been, been able to occur because of readers and people who like you who take time. Yes. I care about art, I care about literature, but I also, when I say thank you, I'm not just thanking you on behalf of art and literature and open-mindedness and thoughtfulness and philosophy and reflection. I'm also thanking you because you have helped um, me make a living and, and raise a family and, uh, and that is ongoing. So I really appreciate it and thank you for your time. And now after hearing me talk for an hour, you know why I need to revise and edit my writing. <laughs> Well, well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Thank you for thank joining you so us. I know. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Delightful evening. Answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anybody can stay, and we'll wrap up and talk about next next meeting. But thank you, Michael Perry, for joining us. I think he's already gone. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. That was wonderful. Yeah, he came early and gave us a full hour. That was actually even more than an hour. That was fantastic. So thank you all for being here and for your questions. Does anybody have things they want to say about the book that they didn't want to say with the author present or just just in general you want to mention? Or? I, I love, love this. And I think that I could see a lot of the characters in the Jackson Port Fire Department and I could write a book about them. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was really a great just a you know just small town fire department and I loved his description of the people and like uh, Jane said he really has a, an in just psyching out people and, and bringing that to the page I really enjoyed that mm -hmm. it was good I loved his descriptions he described things so well I, I thought he did he does a really good job whether it's comedy and there were some really funny parts in that book, um, but to be able to write as well about comedy and 
tragedy and sorrow uh, that he does. I, I thought it was impressive. Mm -hmm. I was I was impressed with how he was able, as Jane was just saying, to transition within the same chapter, just uh, within um, paragraphs after the other, to move from the perception of, of, of a person, a common person, and who they were, to something uh, funny about them or their own perceptions, and then to have a whole discourse on the meaning of death, and then go back to... Um, to, to to wrap it up and at the end of the chapter he would go back to that person and bring it around to the specific again and um he, he really was wrapping the the universal within the specifics and he, without its being i think uh, ponderous i you know i never felt that it was a heavy it, it felt a, a natural flow from what he was doing which was dealing with death and tragedy um it, it was it seemed to be just a natural incorporation into his writing and uh, I, I it was it was the second time i had read it and this time i really read it more carefully i, I was impressed with his writing it's, mm -hmm. it's I think remarkable well this this so, is obviously so very this is obviously a very very smart man you know yeah. he, he he's quick at all everything and and just really really bright there's no doubt about it well, what i remember most from that book was the very last chapter where his brother's wife oh, they're attending i mean that that rocked uh, that was just yeah. that, that really brought it home for me mm -hmm. and does anybody know did his brother jed because that was a sad part when he mm -hmm. wrote about her accident and and death, and they'd only been married seven weeks. Does anybody know if his brother Jed remarried? No, I don't matter. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't in one of the other books. I, I'm yeah. kind of trying to work through some of them to see if I find that out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, he incorporates his family so much, but not a lot of specifics, really, you know. So I, I'm having. I wondered where he went. To live when he was sixteen, he said he went to. He's been living on his own. That, <laughs> that was another of my questions. But. We'll call him back. We've got more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Email him from the website. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, can we bring can we bring our books back that we've had for three months now? You can, but <laughs> take your time because I'm plowing through big stacks. So. <laughs> but the book drop is open. Uh, but, but can we pick books up too? You can, you can. You'll have to call and let me know what you need and we'll set a time okay. for the pickup. But yes, it has to be something we have in here. Interlibrary loan is not back up yet. Okay. Tracy, while, I'm, while I have you, um, mm -hmm. can I have that one copy and can I pick it up on Saturday? Are you going to be around? Yes, Saturday? yes, okay. yes, I will. Write me down for that. I will, I will. I've got to pick up starting at 11, so I'll put it out for you. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And what's the next book? So we did we did decide to stick with our pick for July. It'll be the Dutch House and Pratchett. Was it Pratchett? Patchett? Patchett. 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 <laughs> I don't have it in front of me to look. Um, because I heard back from enough of you that either had it or you're you're close to getting it. You're on the list on, on the electronic copies. So we're gonna stick with that. Um, if you have trouble getting it, feel free to let me know. And if a copy comes back, I can let you know and, and, and be sure to check it out to you. So um, I'd like a copy. Me too. If you would put me on the list, I appreciate it. Okay, okay. Uh, moving forward from that, we were going to do graphic novels for August. I think we may have to postpone that just because those, it's harder to get electronically if we need to still at that point. So that might be something better for when we're in person. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, I don't know, we'll come up with, if anybody has ideas, let me know. Otherwise, I'll uh, do some research and make sure there's things that are, you know, quite available, either if it's electronic or at our libraries that you can go pick up. So, but yeah, for next, for July, we'll read Dutch House. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. So Hope to great. see you all soon. Great to see you. Are you going to get Ann Patchett to come? 
Nah. <laughs> I couldn't get Michelle Obama, unfortunately, last month. Yeah, Michelle was busy, but we could check with Anne. I've been to her bookshop. I've been to Anne's bookshop in a uh, bookstore in Nashville, and it's very, very nice. I did meet uh, kind of related. I went to, ended up at a book signing for Chelsea Clinton there. Oh. We just happened to, to, to be there. And we're like, well, let's stay. Chelsea Clinton's coming. And my son's <laughs> like, who is this? I don't care. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good week. You too. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Boop, boop.